bless you. We praise you. We thank you, God, for today. We thank you we can come together as a body, as a church, recognizing, God, God, the need that we have for you. And I pray that you, in your infinite wisdom, Lord God, will use me for your glory and remove all distractions from our hearts and minds that we can hear that the words won't be just my words, Lord God, but you will do what you know how to do best. And to convict us, not because you want to condemn us, but because you love us so much and you desire for us to engage in a relationship with you. So I bless you, I honor you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. This week has been a challenging week for me when it comes to prepare the message. I've been going through um, the first Peter and when you preach the Bible and you follow through what the Bible says, it's quite challenging because you have to preach what's in there. It's easy to take a scripture and then you do something around it, but it's hard when you have to keep going with the flow. So I have been wrestling uh, the whole day just for you to have a picture. One day I spend the whole day trying to figure out what the scripture says and how to presented in such a way it's according to the context so um i walked back and forth i walked outside i came back over and over again and finally it seems like it's coming together so hopefully this morning what you are going to hear is the message coming together and i titled my sermon ministering in god's house this is for us when it comes to the physical aspect, this is God's house for us. We come in here as people. We come in here as one and one. We come to worship, meaning we come to open our hearts. We come to thank God for life and so many other things. But often we see this life of God, a life to achieve things. You know, we... We want to, especially for us in America, we want to achieve the American dream. We all want to have, we all want, all want to live large. One day we want to have this, do you know that dream? Everybody tells you about that dream there. And the reality is that many have achieved that dream. And they find that their heart is still broken. Because the dream doesn't really satisfy the need of the soul. Of the spirit. So when we also we come in this house, we are not coming in pursuit of that dream. We're coming in pursuit of doing what God desires us to do. God is drawing us together for one purpose, to glorify his name. God is drawing us together not for us to put our hope in material things, in spiritual things. As you know, everything that's material breaks, wears out, wears down, evil this handsome body. There's nothing that will last forever. Everything decays. So it's sad for a person to put their hope in things that are decaying. God that knows best, that knows that the things that we can put our eyes on it will disappear, has, has designed a better life. A better life that oftentimes many people don't understand. A better life that many times many resist, don't want to engage with it. Because it's a life of sacrifice. We come here because we all profess to know Christ as Savior. I hope if you know Jesus Christ as Savior. And we come to worship God. Also, we come to serve Him. Have you ever asked yourself, what is it that God wants us to do as one, as one body? The house of God is a place where we come to worship and praise and surrender our lives to Him. And in chapter 1, of, of chapter one and 2, Peter plays with the words, using metaphors that, uh, that I hope you will follow me because he says one thing one time and the next thing he changes again. 
So I hope at the end of the service, you will say, Pastor Siegfried, you did not confuse me. And you will make me very, very happy. Just wanted to know that. Do you know, the first step into developing a relationship with Christ. People talk about religion. We talk about having a relationship with God, with Christ. The only way, let me just say, um, say this to you. The only way we can love one another, it's because God is love. The only way we can love one another, it is be God because God is love. The world lives in such a way as if love is something outside of God. It's not true. The only way the sinner can love, hopefully they love, is because God is love. Love is something designed by God. And when you get close to God, you will enjoy it to the other most. With God. So the first step in developing a relationship with Christ is to believe in Him and declare openly that He died for us on the cross. And if you have done this, you know, they will say, you are born again. You have a new life, a new creation. It happens when you say, Jesus, I believe that one you, when you hung on the cross, it was for my sins. And He comes into your life. It's a new life. This new life needs to be nurtured. Sometimes people come, they accept Christ, and they, went, they want all the bells and whistles, and they want to walk away and live their own way. No, it needs to be nurtured. As you know, anything living, anything that's alive, grows over time and needs to be nurtured and needs to be taken care of. The same thing, our new life, to nurture the relationship with Jesus Christ to accomplish his purpose, to nurture this relationship. So we go to the scriptures, part of it I read yesterday, when the apostle encourages all believers to crave for the nourishment that helps them to grow in Jesus Christ, to grow. First Peter 2, 2 says, like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you may grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment now that you have had a taste of the Lord's kindness. And we're going to go to verse 4. It says, you are coming to Christ who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. So now we're switching words. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into a special spiritual temple. What's more, you are holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. You would say, Pastor, what are you talking about? Hmm? Jesus is a living cornerstone. We are living stones. We are a spiritual temple. And finally, we are priests. Hmm? You say, I am disqualified. And God is calling us to offer spiritual sacrifices. Again, the apostle compares the new life. Remember, you, you have a new life. The new life in Christ doesn't turn old. It doesn't get old. It doesn't collect social security. Okay? It doesn't become a senior citizen. No, you know, and also, you know how you feel as a senior. When you become senior, they start telling you, you know, you go to the back of the line. See? But the new life in Christ is not like this. It's the one that's vibrant, it's the same, and gets better. So babies, you know, are born with a big appetite. And frequently, they want to eat. And they crave for milk. The, I won't say the minute they're born, but as soon as they grow enough. They want to eat. But they crave for milk based upon, I, I, I hope I'm using the right word, instinct. It's in, the, in them that a baby, a baby gets hungry and the, all they do is, is cry. They, they, they want milk. So the Apostle Peter says, you crave for milk. Now, do you know what the difference is between a baby and us? The difference is the baby cries out of instinct. We 
have to create the habit of craving for the milk. We have to intentionally make this. We have to crave intentional. Make craving intentional in our lives. It means now that you have tasted who God is. Now you have to look at the cross and know what happened at the cross. Now that you know God is good. Now you know that God forgives you. Now you know that God is, loves you. It says now crave, have a desire for his word, for the scriptures, to know more of him. Because that's the only way we can sustain the new life. In this relationship with Christ, we struggle. There's many, many reasons we struggle sometimes. But often, a main reason that people struggle is because they don't crave for the spiritual milk. They don't crave for the word of God. They don't have a habit to read their Bible. And, and you know, we spoke about, that, about this last week. We have so many reasons why we don't read the Bible because an, uh, 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 a science fiction is easy. It's too complicated. It's too difficult. We have, we have so many reasons. But my friends, I say to you, when you know, when you know what Jesus did for you, doesn't it inspire you to struggle? Like I told you before at the beginning, I had to wrestle with the scripture. I had to fight. I, I sat on my desk. I went outside. I was standing outside once, twice. I, I, I left it. Sometimes I got frustrated, but I came back again. Because do you know why? Because I knew that between in these scriptures, there is a treasure. There is something that God wants to say and something that I need to learn. So I press in because I wanted to learn. Because I know God hasn't given me the scripture to keep it disclosed. But God desires for me to learn something. And he does. He always, it's not the first time I have this challenge. He always does. I don't know what God has delivered you from. I don't know your struggles and pain and difficulties. You know, and you know why you're here. So the scriptures encourage us to crave for the word, a better knowledge and understanding. Because once you know the word of God, you'll find hope and strength to deal with the um, challenges of life. This life of sin, this life it always wrestles, doubts. Fear, intimidation, and plainly sometimes rebellion. Do you ever feel like you want to do what you want to do? Hmm? Don't you feel like someday you want to just go do whatever life offers you? Don't be quiet. Don't tell me I'm the whole person in the universe that has this, this, this problem. Don't tell me that. But when you know the word of God, oh, when you know that in Christ you can overcome everything that comes your way because God has given us all the re resources to overcome. When we say, I have victory in Jesus, like we sing the song, Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. It means that you have the victory, but you have to do something about it. You see, you have to seek it. You have to bend your knees. You have to pray. You must read the word of God. And nowadays, I'm going to tell you, there is no excuse why we don't read, why we don't have a plan. And I'm going to say this to you. When you go in front of God, you hold you accountable. With technology, there are so many ways to either read, even if you are illiterate, you can listen to your Bible on something. Although CDs nowadays sometimes is hard, but MP3, MP4, whatsoever it is, even YouTube. If you crave, if you create this habit, habit in you, you will do whatsoever it takes to nurture yourself. Parents go do the craziest thing to save their children from danger. And do you know why? Because they love them. And when you love Jesus, you will be willing to sacrifice yourself to engage with him 
to get to know more about him. Why do we have to crave for the word of God? Because the Bible is the instrument that the Holy Spirit uses to nurture us. Nurture us. It's written by men or humankind, but it contains God's words. The, the initiative is God. Remember, all this, what we're doing, is God's initiative. You're saved because we know John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, God gave his son. We, we weren't the one that came and said, God, here. No, God gave first. And when we understood how we were, then we accepted him. In our life, God desires intimacy. Do you know one of the things that we often want to do is we don't want to remain in Christ. But Jesus said this in John 15, 7. But if you remain in me, he was talking about uh, um, the, um, everything is keeping in mind right now. The vine and the branches, the tree and the branches, Okay. He said, but if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask anything you want and I will be granted. If you remain in me, how do you remain in Jesus Christ? You remain in Jesus Christ when you know God's word, when you understand how much he loves you and you obey him. And he said, my words, how does the word of God remain in you? You need to read it. You need to memorize it. You need to eat it. You need to do Everything, how does it remain? You see, when, when you don't, we don't spend the time, fill our minds with the word of God, every other thought will creep in. Every other desire. Even right now, maybe some of you might be thinking about what you're going to cook after service. I know that. At home. You can spend endless time in front of that TV. But that is not nurturing. It doesn't strengthen you. And sometimes we want everybody to pray for us. Oh, I can pray for you, yes. But how different it is when I pray for you and then what I say has witness within you because you know the word. You know that God heals, not because Pastor Siegfried says it. You want me to pray for you, for me to have faith. But it's different when you know what faith is. And you can say, God, I believe in you. Then we come together and it works. Intimacy with God. But now the apostle here switches to something totally different. He talks about Jesus being the living stone, the most important stone. That's why I told you I was trying to figure out how do I switch over to this. So I'm switching anyways. Peter previously referred to Jesus as the living stone and the living word. Living hope and living stone. And now he's called a living cornerstone of God's temple. Jesus is a person who has life in himself and he gives us to others. He has the eternal life. As a stone... He's invincible uh, in strength and everlasting duration. God's temple. The temple in the olden day, the physical temple, played a major role in the lives of the people because that's where they went to meet, to experience the presence of God. In the temple, it was where the priest, let's say compared to the pastor, the priest was the man that was, was the mediator between God and man. So how did he do this? He would bring animal sacrifices and other rituals. They had to kill an animal every single day to pour the blood. And that's how people were forgiven. But then Jesus Christ came. And Christ became the priest. And he offered his life for our sins. For our um, forgiveness. And since Christ did this for us, now we don't have to, we don't need a, a priest to intervene between God and us no more. So Jesus became the high priest. Now, my, I hope you're following me. Now, Peter switches. He's talking about a different temple built with living stones. So we have to stop thinking about this. 
Think about the spiritual temple. Jesus Christ is the foundation of this temple. The most important stone. He's using a figure of speech. The cornerstone was um, the principal stone in a construction in the, old, in, that, in, the old, in the olden days. It was the focal point of a building, the thing on which most depends the structure or, or integrity. Structural integrity. Like the foundation. But there was one of most important stone, and Jesus Christ is the stone to build this temple. So God desires now to build a spiritual temple. And Jesus Christ is the most important stone. But how is God going to build this temple? With you and I. So we are living stones. Because when we accept Christ as Savior, we are born again. We have a new life. A life that comes through Christ himself. So now we're talking a little bit more spiritual, spiritual aspect. You and I are living stones to build God's temple because God has a plan and God has a purpose for us and with us. Although Christ came as an important stone, you know, he was rejected by even his own people, like it says in John 1.11. He came to his own people and they even rejected him. But to their surprise, Jesus Christ was the most important stone. He was the plan of God. He was the, God, the one God was going to use to save humanity from all sin. If you look at Jesus Christ, he, has, he, he is. He has all the aspects of the foundation stone. Example, Jesus Christ is the firstborn of all creatures. He's the agent of creation. Through him, God created all things. He's the foundation of humanity, the root from which it springs, the head in which he's gathered into one. He is the foundation on which the individual soul must build all hope, joy, and goodness. The only foundation because our hope is in him. And he's the basis of all true thoughts of God, men, immorality, and duty. So Jesus Christ is our inter the, the one that died for us. He's the one that right now that intercedes for us. So now the job of the priest has changed. We don't need the priest to offer sacrifices because Jesus Christ became the sacrifice. And now that he's in heaven, he's the one that intervenes for us. That's why we pray to Jesus. We pray in the name of Jesus because he's at the right hand of the Father and he's intervening for us. So now the apostles... Um, sets the stage and turns to us. He says that we are living stones. Those that believe in Christ, born again, that God is building into a spiritual temple, a house. God is constructing something. God is building a house. And the, the material that God is using, you don't find it at Home Depot. You don't find it at Lowe's, you find it in the church. And God is using living stones. He isn't using dead stones. Why living? Because you and I say we know Jesus. And Jesus is alive. So when Jesus is alive, he is in us. We are alive. We are living people. We have eternal life. And God wants to use us. I like the way that the, the translation of the, of the message presents it because I, I see it more as, as volunteer. Volunteer your life, Ken. Volunteer your life. It says in the message, present yourself as building stone for the construction of the sanctuary. Present yourself. I like it because oftentimes we think these things happen by osmosis or by just moving. No. God is building a spiritual temple. God isn't pushing. But based upon your experience of born again, He wants you to volunteer your life. To present yourself. To say, God, here I am. I want to be part of this temple that you are building. 
in the idea of presenting yourself is to show up willingly. Again, I repeat, it takes away the idea that you need to be pushed or cross your arm. No, you cross your arms, it will not, it will not happen. It will not. We have to think uh, on what God has done for us and based upon this, present ourselves. Ephesians 2, 5 says, even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when Christ raised from the dead. Sometimes I wonder, do we really capture this? Do we really understand what it means? Even when we were dead in our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. From the dead. Even when we were all the way in darkness, not really caring about God, cursing Him, He gave us life. And this happened when Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. So in Christ lies our hope. The day that you said to Jesus, I welcome you, God has given you a new life. Life eternal. Based upon the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. God has given us a new life. We can say, I don't die no more. I'm protected. I'm born again. I'm saved. So it, these are the lives, your life and my life, that God wants to build in a spiritual house. That consists of many members, as you know. Many members connecting together by God's Spirit. This process of adding more living stones is ongoing because as more people are getting saved, God is bringing them together to continue to build His house for the glory of His name, to build His kingdom. Again, I said to you, it's about presenting yourself. Colossians 3.10 says, put on your new nature. You see, this morning when I was getting ready to come to church, I went into my closet, I grabbed this shirt, and I put it on. I didn't go into my closet and stand with like this and say, shirt, come on, come on, come my shoulder. Come on, shirt. Otherwise, I would be waiting still at home. No, I intentionally, just for you to have a little bit of my uh, last night, I took the time, I ironed it, prepared it, so this morning I can wear it. I had exactly in my mind what I'm going to do and where, how I was going to wear the shirt. The same thing like you. Intentionally, I don't think you, you put a blind over your eyes and you went in the closet and you looked for a shirt or a dress or shoes because the ladies had like 200 shoes. Is it true? Let them go on vacation, you will see. They take 10 suitcases with them. I hope I won't get in trouble. So, but intentionally you go and you put it on. And, and church is the same thing with this new life. Intentionally you put the new man. Intentionally you let go of the old habits. And you put on the new one based upon what God has done for you. You volunteer your life. Jesus, you have done so much for me. Here I am. And then it doesn't stay there. Then we add, you volunteer your life for service. God hasn't saved you to keep you. Like when you walk around and when you go shopping, you see all these, um, what do you call them, mannequins you call them? God hasn't called us to be in showcases for people to come. God has called us to live. To serve him. So now, not only do, are we, I hope this doesn't bog your mind or make it difficult, to, difficult for you. Not only are we living stones. It says now, what's more, you are holy priests. Through the mediation, mediation of Christ, you can offer spiritual sacrifices. Now we say in the, in the olden days, the priest was the only person. In Christ now, 
We all are priests and we all can offer sacrifices. The priest used to go and kill an animal and, and do that ritual. Now we all are responsible to offer our own sacrifices through Jesus Christ because he died for us on the cross. And today the church is called priesthood because of each one of us. In Revelation 1.6 it says, He has made us a kingdom of priests for God his Father. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. You are, watch, you are much more than what you think. God sees you much more different than the way you see yourself. It's written in the word of God. These things aren't written for us to stay at a distance. Today, more than ever, so many people have so many opinions on how to do what we're doing. Well, few people really dare to make their feet wet. The church is a new priesthood. In the temple, we are the ones that offer the sacrifices. We are the temple. We are the building. Only God can do that. And Jesus Christ has qualified us all for his service. Because he knew we couldn't do it. But he's our great priest. And he's in heaven. It says, because Christ, our great priest, is in heaven, in Hebrews 4, 14 through 15, it says, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. For he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. Do you know the reason why many of us are so distant? It is because of our weaknesses. We're ashamed, we're embarrassed, and we struggle. We struggle because we're sinners. But there is a way to overcome. And when you believe, and when you nurture yourself, you will overcome. Otherwise, nobody will be able to stand here and say anything to you. There is a way, and Jesus Christ is the way, the foundation stone, the only stone, the only way through which we can walk and develop a relationship with him. Now we talk about offering spiritual sacrifices. You may say, Pastor, what are these? The first thing is to offer your life, your thought life, your heart, your reason for being, I would say, your reason for living. You offer your body. You don't put your bodies through things that you know are contrary to the word of God. You don't. Including how we take care of our bodies, including our diets. We don't, we don't have any more idols in our life. Things that we put first before God. Our souls, our feelings, emotions. Do you know, even uh, to be willing to forgive because Christ forgives us, and that's a tough one. To be willing to forgive those that hurt us. Considering that Jesus Christ has um, forgiven us our desires. You may have a desire in your life to do something and then you know that God is calling you. We, we, we like to use the word, I don't do what I should do. And sometimes I ask, so when are you going to do what you should do? Because if over 20 years you're telling me the same thing, you're telling me you're not doing nothing. If you're always striving to do what you, you should do, and you don't do what you should do, what are you doing? If you're always trying to do what you should do, and you don't know what you should do, what are you doing? Zero. Nothing. And, and, and it becomes an excuse from Spirit sacrifices is to let go and do 
what you should do. And do what the Bible says. And obey God's words. Our desires. We have many desires for good things, for bad things. Spiritual sacrifices to offer them up to God. Our prayers. The way we pray. Some people cannot find what to pray for. There's a lot to pray for. And, and, and really, it isn't so much what you pray for, but the heart in which you pray. Do you know, there's a story of a woman in, in the Bible called Hannah when she wanted a baby and she was at the altar and she was praying and she was shedding tears. Because the way her life was hard, the way, she, the things she was going through, it hurts. It's not that God answers, but it shows you the dedication and commitment. Spiritual sacrifices, is, it means to show you commitment with God, church. I want to encourage you, throw excuses out of the window. Throw, if you identify yourself as a person born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, it is possible for you to establish a prayer life. It is possible because God will bring to your mind what to pray for. Many prayers are an answer because people don't stay enough. They don't cry enough. They don't push enough. They want it quick. And God knows the heart. God knows how many will want you to pray for them. And out the door they go. And maybe that's why he keeps us, for, so we can we de develop relationship with him. Our praises to him, giving thanks, our lives, how we live. Also is our services to other people. As a body, God is building a spiritual body. God is building a church with many, many, many members. And you tell me sometimes, church. How come we are so needy as a body? Because often we don't present ourselves as living sacrifices. I, I'm not saying everybody should be like me. But I'm saying there's a room enough for everyone to know what their position is in Christ. To be part of their spiritual body. Because God's desire is to save souls. Do you know church? We are so frustrated, I told you last Sunday, we are so frustrated with what's going on in the world. The world is doing what it's designed to do. Because it's evil. Evil is rising. And there are some things about evil that we will never understand. But what we need to do is look at our Bible because God is sovereign. Jesus Christ defeated the devil on the cross. And now he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. So we have to choose who is going to get more of our attention. The world that's fading away or Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that died for our sins and he's alive. When we seek him, he will, feed, he will strengthen us. And we will defeat the world. We will. I'm not saying to you we shouldn't stand up. Yes, but what I'm saying to you is too much, too many of us are being consumed by the news of the evil. And God help us to be consumed by the word of God. To find our strength. To pray for our nation. To pray for our church. To pray for our people. So we can proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you want to be consumed. Be consumed on your knees. If you want to be consumed. Be concerned about the plan. That God has for, for, for humanity. Be consumed with a plan. Hallelujah. Seek Him, cry out to Him, ask Him for direction, ask Him for wisdom, ask Him for guidance, and ask Him, God, how can you use me in this crazy world in which I'm living? That's what we should do. 
When you abide in Christ, you will learn what to do with your life, where to go and what to do. When you abide in Christ, I can only tell you about what will happen to you. But you are the one that has to present yourself. You are, you are the one that say, God, here I am. Use me. In Romans 12, 1. The Apostle Paul says to us, people are to us in the letter. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be, let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way of worshiping. The act of offering something means you offer something to God. Worship and thanksgiving. You express gratitude for his goodness. God is looking for people. Are willing to present themselves as living stone to minister into his house. Remember. Heaven and earth shall pass away. Remember this. Everything you see them fighting for right now, all the power you see in Washington, D.C., all the things they do, my Bible tells me one day they will be gone. But what I'm preaching to you right now will remain. All the other stuff will pass away. Everything else. We see evil rising. Politicians being evil. One day the Bible says they need their knees will bow. But when we are born again, we won't be judged based upon that. We'll be judged because God will reward us for the life that we sacrifice today to serve him. So would you come today? To offer your life as a living sacrifice. To build this body so we can preach the gospel. We talk about harvesting beyond the 20s. But it doesn't mean we believe that God will bring souls in our path so we can build the spiritual house. But we, we need laborers. People that are willing to engage. Remember, I'm not saying to you, go home and stop living your life. No, you have responsibilities at home. But what I'm saying is this. Start planning your life and make time for God and trust him and he will bless you. God is looking for living stones to minister into his house. I'm going to close this with this invitation. Request a question. How many of you, or are you willing? I won't say how many. In this day, as God has spoken to you, in this day, I, as I believe you understand what I'm trying to convey to you, are you willing to say, God, are you willing to present yourself? Present yourself as a living sacrifice. As a living stone. Don't think about the ramifications. Are you willing to obey? Because one thing I know for sure. And I'll, I always will say this. I, always, I say this with full assurance. God has spoken. I know this. Not because I'm confident in myself. No. Because it's in the word of God. I know this. Because the Holy Spirit is here. And the Holy Spirit uses the word to speak. Now, it's up to you, your willingness to present yourself to Christ in the areas where God has spoken to you and say, God, here I am.